Good afternoon, one and all. My name is Iya Sahidu Konde, a medical doctor and a RAB member from the Republic of Guinea. Um, I don't know whether you are excited as much as I, because to meet our Dr. Judy is like a real privilege, and I know you will be satisfied today. So, um, to start with, please, um, I've been honored and uh, to introduce you our guest for today, who is no other person but Dr. Judy Dlamini. And Dr. Judy Dlamini is a founder and executive chairperson of the Bekene Group. She's the former chairperson of Espen Pharmacare Limited, a Johannesburg Stock Exchange listed um, South African pharmaceutical manufacturer with more than 60 business operations in more than 50 countries and product distribution in more than 150 countries. <laughs> Bekani Group celebrated in 2016 its 20 years in business. The group has operations and investments in different sectors, including pharmaceuticals, facilities and property management, tourism, surgical management, luxury, and fashion retail. Dr. Judy qualified as a medical doctor in 1985 from the University of Natal. She practiced as a family practitioner for many years, after which she transitioned as a consultant in occupational health in many companies, including um, Rainbow Ch Chicken, a diff pack, a name pack subsidiary, national port operations. After completing her MBA at WIT, having majored in corporate finance, Dr. Judy joined the HSBC Investment Bank, Johannesburg Division in corporate finance. She obtained a doctorate degree in business a leadership from the University of South Africa, where she investigated on the intersection of race, gender, and social class in women's CEO career progression and strategies for gender transformation at leadership level. One of her academic contributions from her research is the wheel theoretical model, which she's going to explain to us later. She converted her thesis in a book titled Equal But Different, which was published in December 2016, and I had the privilege to grab a copy. So please, ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming our distinguished guest for today. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I can see a few familiar faces from last year. Thanks for that uh, introduction. Dr. Judy, to start with, um, as a co-founder of Future Nation School, um, what's your view on uh, education as a whole in Africa? You know, um, in the continent, starting with our own country, we have a lot of challenges. Uh, but uh, all the challenges that we have are centered around leadership. If you look at just our country, uh, the public uh, education system caters for more than 94% of uh, basic education learners. Uh, as a country, we invest about 15% of the total GDP on education, which is higher, I understand, than the UK and the US in terms of percentage uh, investment of total budget. But still, we are not getting the outcomes that you expect. So it's not about money, it's about leadership. It's about the expectations as leaders that we have from the teachers and from the learners. The expectation from the teachers and ensuring that you have teachers who are capable to deliver. A, I, I, I actually understand in Finland, a, you don't teach a subject unless you have a master's in that particular subject. And a, we don't have something similar in this country. There was a study that was done that showed that about 60% of math teachers failed 
maths at the level where they are teaching. So those are the challenges. It's actually leadership that ensures that the expectation that we have and then the planning actually gives the outcomes that we're supposed to derive from education. Thank you. So um, that uh, takes me to our second question. Um, we know we've all heard this for centuries now. I mean, even though efforts have been made um, by governments and partners in reducing access to education, um, there still remain this disproportion in males compared to female in leadership positions. As a prominent female leader um, who has investigated on gender transformation at leadership level, can you please tell us how can we uh, close this gap by using our educational system? Okay. Um, it's a multi-pronged approach. One of the drivers uh, for me, which actually is explained by the title of my book, is that I truly believe that human beings are born equal. Uh, we just have differences within groups and intergroups, but those differences are a strength if you choose to use them as a strength. So that actually motivated me to investigate why, in spite of all we do as women, why you still have leadership positions that are majority male. And uh, I thought, we do a lot of statistics, and uh, when it comes to human issues, we need stories, we need life journeys of people who've walked the journey, because it's through their stories that we'll understand what the issues are. And the women that I interviewed, who are successful women, mainly from South Africa, across race, across social class, because I think those are important social identities which impact on how you are perceived and how your career progression uh, takes uh, place. So they identified five pillars. So when you talk about the wheel model, which I'll address in the same uh, thing, is women on their own are doing a lot already. If you go to universities all over the world and look at the proportion of graduates at junior degree level, at honors level, the proportions have changed. You know, you're getting closer to a 60%, 40% split with the majority of graduates being women. Even when it comes to STEM subjects, it's changing. In this country, it's increasing to about 40%, and it's come from a very long way. So women get it. Women are investing in themselves. So the five pillars start with the woman, of course, because you don't stop investing in yourself. Uh, I'm 58 today, but I'm still studying. I've just finished some course because you don't stop. So, and then the second pillar is your network, your, 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 the core of your support, your support system. Because people are always talking about this thing of balance, which doesn't exist. It doesn't exist for women, it doesn't exist for men. It's just about using your support system to do the best with what you can, with, with what you have, the time that we have, and the resources that you have. So the support system that's critical is those that have partners, whether it's a husband or a wife, that's critical because people who buy into your dream and share the journey with you allow you to achieve so much more if they support you. It's in this country, domestic workers, uh, I don't know about other countries, but in this country, uh, the reason I can sit here and talk about my journey is because of the domestic worker that actually co-parented my kids, that allowed me to have a career. And we don't celebrate them enough, and that is so important uh, that we celebrate them. <laughs> the three other pillars we cannot win the battle without men, right? They are in charge in government, they are in charge in business, they are in charge in civil society. It's important to rope them in. So the wheel actually is going to move and the more there is collaboration, there is congruence in objective and intent from all these five pillars, 
the more we will reach the destination in terms of equity at leadership level. Uh, if I look at this government uh, of South Africa, they have done a lot in terms of policies, right? Where they come up with the employment equity that ensures that women across race are recognized, they get a, uh, opportunities, they've come up with economic empowerment, where again women are recognized, but they haven't done enough in terms of implementation of those policies. They just need encouragement from us. When you look at the women uh, uh, department, the government has a, a, a specific department for women, and you look at the budget that they allocate to that department, it, it's a shame. Uh, so sometimes you have this tick the box mentality uh, which doesn't move the needle because you need resources, you need to fund these things uh, adequately for you to have an impact. So, and when it comes to civil society, there are so many things that are wrong, not just in this country, not just in the continent, in the world. Me Too is just one of the symptoms of how women continue to be depressed, I mean oppressed, and actually used uh, without having a voice because you're scared of the, re the repercussions. Will you be believed? So it's all these things that require not just women, but men who are in leadership position to actually say, we hear you and we are here to make the change. Because if we do that change, then we'll, do, we'll perform better uh, as countries. So I like what uh, Dr. Pum Silem Lamboluka is doing at the UN Women uh, uh, Agenda. UN gender because she has actually said, we can't do it alone. We need he for she. I need business, civil society, uh, tertiary institutions to actually endorse this and show that they are keen to make the change and commit to what change they are going to make. Where are they today? What changes are they going to make and over what period? It's measurable, it's commitment, and I think if each one of us does that work with both men and women to change the status quo? We have a chance yeah, of achieving it. Oh, we cannot win the battle without the men. And I know there are many he for he she's in this hall. <laughs> so, um, Dr. Glamini, this takes us to our next question. Um, and as the team of uh, this session is transforming education to prepare Africa's youth for the future. Um, through your extensive knowledge, looking at this hall, we just have the cream of the crop of African youth here. How do you think they can participate in this transformation? The best way to start here is talking about what we did as a family uh, in terms of how we felt we can participate. And uh, each one of us can participate, but each one of us has a different context. So as a family, I went to the same high school with my husband. Uh, so we've always given back to our high school. It just made sense. But we've gone beyond that in different measures that I won't bore you with. But when we, we lost our son in 2012, uh, one of the things that came to mind is that, you know, maybe let's build a school in his name. Because one of the things that he did, he was already a corporate financer working for PwC. And with his friend, he had put together a, an NGO a, that went to township schools and said, how do we assist the principals to make sure that a, those kids that come from, that don't have parents, do their homework, a, put in money, ensure that they are mentors, and so forth. So we actually said, we need to take the baton from him and uh, donate a school. Met with government, the process was well advanced when there were changes in, gov in government. And uh, like you know, in most countries, especially in our continent, with the change of the leader, even if it's within the same party, everything changes. So unfortunately, that initiative collapsed. But what it said to us is that, you know, uh, ideally, we want to support the public sector because, as I said earlier on, it actually is accountable for 94% of the learners. Uh, but if we can't get the right person that we can support, 
let's do something. They'll find us somewhere ahead. So for two years, we went all over the world looking for a model that prepares our youth for the 21st century. Because most of the models all over the world are actually still very read, regurgitate. The teacher is the reservoir of knowledge. The kids are supposed to come with a blank, blank slate that is to be informed by what the teacher knows. There's a problem in that. Because what we are creating uh, are people that don't have analytical thinking, are people that are not solutions based, are people that are job seekers instead of job creators. If you look at the number of, uh, the percentage of youth that uh, we know we are going to have in the next 10 years, 15, 20, it's going to be quite important how we prepare them to be solutions based as opposed to just people who are waiting for leaders to come up with solutions. So the model that we liked, we found at HTH in San Diego. And what we liked about that model is that it had an expectation that when a child walks in, they actually have something to give. There's an expectation that their minds, their ideas count. And how do you nurture that with what you know? How do you collaborate in a class? The same way you do case studies at business school. Project-based learning does that. So you have brainstorming amongst the learners uh, who actually come with problems that they have encountered. You brainstorm about what is the best solution. And then you come up with projects. At the end of the term, you actually have parents coming to look at the projects that are displayed. And students uh, proudly present their projects to their parents uh, for grade one, first term last year, they actually came up with a book that they printed of the work that they had done. The pride in those learners is amazing because you actually are seeing them as partners. You see value in them. So we believe that through doing what we are doing, amongst other things, one of the things that we did is to uh, take the Montessori model for early childhood. And uh, one of the things that is important through research that we all are aware of, that multilingualism is actually brilliant uh, for developing the, the, the children's brains. Uh, so the Montessori schools that we have teach Mandarin. They teach one local African language. They teach English. So you actually have leaders that are also exposed to good African leadership, which is really the other point, because one of the challenges that we have, there is this idea that everything good comes from the worst. Everything inferior and bad comes from the continent. We are not going to raise proud leaders if we continue with that colonized mind of looking at things. So at Future Nation schools, we celebrate African leaders. We have enough African leaders in the continent that we can celebrate. We need to share those stories. We need to talk about those stories. If you come to South Africa and look at the history uh, that we're still teaching our kids, it's about Jan van Riebeek. It's like nothing existed prior to uh, the colonization uh, of the country. And I'm happy that the government is looking at changing that because one of the important things for any human being anywhere in the world is pride and understanding who you are and being happy with who you are, celebrating the success of the people that actually came before your time. So those are all the things that we try to inculcate in a future nation a, a, a student. And more importantly, ethical servant leadership is the cornerstone of what we try to pass to children. Wow. I told you guys, you'll be impressed. <laughs> so um, Dr. Glavini, let's talk about your book. Your book titled Equal but Different, um, which, is, which is based on your research, which you discussed and recommended the real theoretical model. First of all, um, would like you to elaborate a bit on this theory and later tell us 
how can we use this model to improve our continent, our countries, and ourselves as fellows? You know, what I always say, earlier on we were discussing about in quite a few countries, not just in this country or this continent, the world over, there is an element of uh, disillusionment. I think uh, the world goes through phases where you have remarkable leaders, you know? And uh, you also go through phases where it's just like everything is collapsing, you know? Uh, in this country, we have our own issues, but uh, they are not different to countries in, uh, I mean, to issues in other countries. What I always say, because it's easy to get overwhelmed and feel like disillusioned. One of the things I refuse is to feel helpless. The reason we survived apartheid and did the things that we did and we were able to take the baton and run when we got independence is because we always had hope, we never gave up, and we fought and made a difference where we were. So my message to every person in the room is that there is so much that each one of us can do. And there is so much that you can change. It starts with baby steps. You know, in the book, I actually talked to one of the ladies that I spoke to is Cesar um, Zimela. She got her education from Swaziland, though she's from South Africa. What that did for her, because in Swaziland the education was superior and uh, the race thing was such a non-issue. So when she came with her BSc to South Africa, uh, she didn't understand this baggage thing. So she would challenge the status quo. She was happy in her own skin. And she says, one guy used to call her bumblebee. And she just didn't understand why she's called a bumblebee. And that someone explained and said, you see, a bumblebee can't fly, but because no one told it that it can fly, it actually tries to fly. So that says, that talks to attitude, an attitude that you can, but more importantly, an attitude that because you have this privilege, everyone in this room is privileged. If we go back to where we come from, you go back to the village where maybe your parents come from, they need you to do something that will help them be better because someone invested in you. Each one of you is here because someone saw something in you, invested in you, you allowed them to. It can't be just for you and your immediate family and your extended family, which is typical in Africa because... <laughs> Thank you. So you have to make a change. In this country, you have a lot of young people in their 30s who form themselves into groups and they go to the township, they go to the rural areas and mentor kids, identify someone within the village and support that person to actually mentor because it's so much a mindset and education that if we just focus on that, it might mean that you give an allowance to a student who's at university but doesn't have parents. They just happen to get a bursary in this country from an ESPAS or whoever else, but that's not enough to carry them through because they need an allowance. Sometimes all it takes is just give a thousand rand and then also support. Give off your time, give off your skill, and if there is money, please. Give everything you have to change the status quo because I believe we can. Thank you very much. Um, this one is a bit personal. Yeah. <laughs> See, I am also a medical doctor, but when I was at the fac, all, I mean, first of all, I was dreaming of becoming a footballer, if you never know. <laughs> a large Jew and the rest were my stars. But when I entered the fac, all I had to do was to crack anatomy, pathology, all the logics, you know. But here is a lady who beat the odds. So, Dr. Lenny, your story um, is that of someone who really 
made it against the odds. I mean, when the education system was meant to train you to be a house elf, you went uh, and beat the odds, and you became a medical doctor, and now you are a successful entrepreneur. I mean, tell us a bit how you, take us through this path, how you went on with all this. I, I always credit, credit my parents because I just watched them do everything. They, it, it was during the dark days of apartheid where they actually didn't have an identity, if you know. They didn't have a vote. They were a non-existent nuisance, basically, according to the system of the day. But what I admired about them is that they just got on with it. They hustled. They, my mother did three different jobs to make sure that we got a better education. My dad didn't have much education, but he invested everything in us to be better. And the conversation in the house, and this is so important because some of you are parents or parents-to-be, the conversation in the house was an attitude of can-do. We were never victims. It was a system that was wrong. Even at the age of two, three, four, I knew there's something wrong with this system. There's nothing wrong with me. That's the attitude that allows you to be a victor rather than a victim. So when I saw someone who was a doctor, when my sister spoke about the person who's a decision maker uh, within the ward because she was a professional nurse, the doctor came like the, the person who was in charge, you know, who had the final word. I love control. I love having the final word. So that appealed to me. So that coupled with an education-based foundation from my parents, a never give up attitude because I went to medical school, but I failed at medical school. So my can do, will do, fighter spirit allowed me never to give up. Actually, that failure made me a better person because it brought humility. It's funny how humility makes you a better person. It's, it's amazing. You know, when you watch people who are arrogant, you almost pity them because they, they lose so much from just being humble, uh, learning from everyone in their, in, in their context. Like in my business, everyone has a say. Everyone is valued because in our differences, they strength. Just because someone makes tea for us, is not because they have inferior intellect. It's because they didn't have the type of parent that maybe you had to actually say education, education. Their context has made them where they are, but it, does make it, it doesn't make them less. So my message really is attitude of can do, will do, and just never giving up. I've been in boardrooms, you know, I'm quite happy that you're a medical doctor, it's so difficult when you now try and cross over into a new career because you come from a profession where you believe you know it. Uh, if you don't, you know the way around, and then you leave that comfort zone, which is brilliant because leaving a comfort zone allows you to learn. It allows you to challenge yourself. It allows you to, to see gaps in what you know. Uh, but you'd be in a boardroom with people that have been in corporate for years and you would be a beginner. So I would be in rooms where I knew the list, but I worked three times more than everyone else in the room. Can do attitude, never giving up, allowed me to have my impact and have the staying power, and then, and the respect of the people around the room. So each one of us can actually change uh, their context if they have that attitude. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So, um, if you don't mind, we would like to take some few questions from the audience. And let's start the, at the back. Can someone help us with the mic? Thank you so much, Doctor. Um, my name is Vincenzia, and I'm from Tanzania. I'd like to ask, how do you balance 
family and work, considering you're a woman and in the African setting, uh, I know that could be challenging. So I'm interested to know how do you balance family and work? Thank you. Uh, I'll answer them as you ask them because I think it will be quicker. Uh, I'll try not to go, I, I tend to go forever, so I'll try. I don't, I don't have a balance, <laughs> right? Um, that's just fact. Uh, I prioritize, I drop the balls and uh, try and pick them up. It's Father's Day on Sunday. I've decided that I'll wake up early and cook breakfast for my husband and then our daughter will take us out to celebrate the dead for lunch. So you just, you just, you know, juggle the balls and uh, there is no balance because <laughs> especially as women, we neglect ourselves. It's everyone else but us. But when you give from a point of nothing, you actually exhaust yourself and there's actually nothing to give. So you need to nurture yourself, nurture your spirit as you try and do the juggling game, but there is no balance. Uh, uh, thank you. So my, my question is, um, what has been your biggest failure to date? And also, when you connect the dots backwards, what was that one moment where you thought, this is when it adds up? Like, this is what adds up my story? Um, sure, I've had so many failures. <laughs> They've all been big, actually. Uh, the first one was at medical school. Um, in business, I chose the wrong partner. Um, wrong because our value system wasn't aligned and uh, it was difficult to get out of it. Had to go through the litigation system, the energy that it drained, the money. Look, I've had a lot of failures. But what I've learned is that they teach you. They teach you about yourself and they teach you about the world and it prepares you better for the next transaction that you do and the next thing that you want to do. When I look back, uh, maybe you'll forgive me if I don't get your question, but the biggest success in my life is my kids. That's the best thing ever. Um, th th they mean the world to me. I now have a grandchild. You know, you, you have no idea. When I lost my son, a part of me died. When she was born, a part of me was born. She is amazing. So I think life is really about family. It's not about money. Money is an enabler. The degrees you collect, good for you, but that's not what it's about. It's about family. It's about purpose. It's about when you give back and you see the impact, no matter how small, it just makes life so worth it. So it's those small things, you know, that really matter. Good afternoon, Dr. Lamini. My name is Dumi Zanzi. I was going to be very upset if you didn't give me the mic. I've had my hand up for a while. Um, Dr. Lamini, I wanted to ask, um, in the area of women's leadership, there's a lot of talk about being a leader. But I want to know from you, as a woman leader, how can we, better, how can we be better followers? Um, how can we better support leaders in our space to get done what needs to get done. Because I find sometimes, I mean, um, Dr. Rampella said yesterday, you know, women don't vote for women. Um, other than voting, what are some of the things as people who are watching leaders try to do good, how can we be better followers? I, I, I disagree with the notion that women don't vote for women, right? I completely disagree. I think women 
get flag from men, from other women, from everyone, because it's such a patriarchal society. Sometimes I'm not going to vote for a woman only because she's a woman, right? I'm going to vote for a woman because she's a good woman, right? And how do we do that? We actually make sure we empower a lot of women so that we increase the probability of having a good woman, you know? So, and you find that, I know, I'm sorry I trans transgressed, but I'm passionate about this. Because I think we just get brought down by everyone. Women don't pull her down. I think that's rubbish. I think men pull each other down. Women pull each, it's not peculiar to a gender, right? But the patriarchal society makes it cool to criticize women. And we need to change that, men and women. Right? How do we become better followers? By being good leaders of self. If you are good at leading yourself, whatever the expectation is from your leader, you will deliver because you're good at leading yourself. Right? You are a good follower if you question. Being a good follower is not blindly following. It's questioning respectfully in the right context and right podium. Obviously, if you challenge a leader in front of a crowd, it's going to be defensive. But if you have those conversations where you bring a different view, that's being a good follower because you bring a different perspective. You give him accolades or her accolades for the leadership, then you just think of talk about things that would actually make it even better. So in my view, each one of us has to master self-leadership to be able to lead well and follow well. There we go. My name is Mpuleke Mundao, and I'm going to try to uh, shorten my question. It's very long. Um, we're talking about transforming education to prepare Africa's youth for the future. I want to ask, because I believe one of the things that we need to look at is creating platforms for the teachers to debrief. Our teachers, our kids spend a lot of time with the teachers. Our teachers, they are mothers, they, some of them, they come with the challenges and it comes out. I do uh, life coaching for kids at a primary level and I've heard teachers calling kids saying that you know, you're gonna be nothing, you're not gonna pass and calling names. These are the realities in our backyards. So I would like to hear your opinion as to what is it that can be done for the teachers because we must remember that they are human being, and in as much as we would love them to be perfect so that they can instill somewhat perfect values to our kids, it never is the case. Thank you. Uh, that, that's very important. And uh, you know, I always say, the first leader you encounter are your parents. The second leader you encounter is the teacher, and they can make or break you. Uh, what we do at Future Nation schools one, we actually take them for training, right? And then we actually have internal trainers. Like when we started the school, they went to San Diego to get training on the model and the challenges, and we now have trainers, or, and then San Diego came here to train them. But more than that, just the training of the teachers on their skill, we have a psychologist in each school. That psychologist is not just catering for the learners. Yes, they are catering for the learners, but they are catering for the teachers as well. Every month, there is leadership training. There is a value system training for teachers because you need to remind people why we're here. The minute a teacher says to a learner, you will be nothing, that teacher is saying, I'm nothing myself. Therefore, all I can pass on to you is being nothing, right? So you need to teach that teacher 
and remind her how important she or he is. One of the things that is done in this country, the National Education Collaboration Trust brings together money from the private sector, money from government, voices from labor, voices from business, that actually, amongst other things, they say, let's professionalize teaching. Let's bring back the dignity that teachers enjoyed from the community. Because when we were young, teachers were respected. It was a respected profession. We've lost that. Now, the mindset of the teacher is going to be affected if the community looks up to him or her to say, wow, you are so important. What happens now is that if you are not doing well in any subjects, like you go and do teaching, otherwise you go and do engineering. And, and we need clever teachers. We need those stem cell subject teachers choosing teaching over everything else. So uh, I hope I've answered you. Uh, thank you. So I'm El Archiba from Guinea uh, and Senegal. Uh, so I would like to talk about human centered design. Uh, you talked about the why, and I would like you to talk about the how. So about policies, about changing education system. My point is, how will we get the youth involved in the decision making? How will we make the young boys and ladies uh, be, be, be involved in working on trying to find what are the best solutions because at the end we all maybe don't like school so much because you want to do something that just as yeah i want also to be a i wanted to play football but finally i'm a software engineer i'm liking it but if i had the choice when i was young it's not what i will choose to do so what will be the best way because everything they did for us without us is done against us so what will be the best way to involve the youth in that decision making to take their ideas? Thank you. Uh, that, that, that's very interesting because it's expecting others to involve you. You have the power to break those doors and open the door and sit around the table. On Saturday, we'll be celebrating 42 years of Shab uh, the Soweto Day, today, the, the youth uh, uprising, where the youth said, enough is enough. Our parents are not delivering. We will do it ourselves. Not so long ago, the youth in this country said, just because I come from a poor background, it doesn't mean I can't access education just because my parents can't pay for it. We will fight, we will bring this country to a stop because we want free access to education. We want free education, uh, fields must fall. So obviously that's the extreme case because you've waited for too long expecting someone to bring you to the room. There are a lot of initiatives everywhere, especially in this country. Yesterday was, I was interviewing a young person, he's 34, for my second book. He has put together an NGO that empowers grade 10 learners, from grade 10 learners up, because he was bright, uh, but when he came to varsity, uh, he had a complex because he went to a rural school. His English wasn't great. He was scared to raise his hand. He felt he was less. And he became a chartered accountant, and when he joined one of the big four, he was lucky to find a leader who actually would say, what's your view? All of a sudden, this shy rural boy had a voice. And he said, how do I change the context of that 16-year-old that I was in a rural school? And he started a, a, a leadership, a, a youth leadership forum, where he goes, it's a national thing now. He started it uh, nine years ago. It's a national thing where great tens come around the room and they are mentored, they get leaders from different uh, sectors uh, of professions, and once they graduate from university, they become mentors. What I'm saying to you is that each one of us has the power 
to change the status quo. It worries me when we circulate old leaders, when you actually can look at the 40-something-year-olds uh, to lead these countries because they bring a fresh perspective. And uh, we still have 70-something-year-olds uh, leading countries. What I'm saying is that don't wait for you to lead a country. Start where you are with what you have and lead and be the change you want to see in the world. And you are so privileged because of where you are today that you can really make that change. One of the young women I met from another country in the continent, she wants to be a president. And she's doing everything with that eye in the prize, but she's starting where she is with what she, what she has to change lives. And that prize will actually be a easy, accessible target because she's done the footwork. So don't ask people to give you space. Make the space and make the change. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think something to follow up with that. Um, usually, um, the, fee, the fees must fall initiative is a good one. But when it falls, um, it comes in with kind of a plateau, a plateau that is people, uh, you have many uh, children attending, but it also means the quality will fall. So how can we like maintain um, attendance and also the quality at the same time? You know, the fees must fall has nothing to do with quality in my view, right? Because one of the things that we need to do as leaders, as government, is to plan for the population that we have, right? And ensure that the expectation we have of our learners is high. One of the things we've done in this country, which is a challenge, and I'm, sh I'm sure we're going to sort it out, is to try its expedience to get votes, where you'd actually say, no, 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 a core math is too hard, let's make literacy math, which is rubbish. Why bother? It's either you get the real thing or you don't bother, one. Two, get the real thing in the true sense of getting it. If you are going to say 30% is a pass, that's insulting the intelligence of the learners. You are expecting less from them. It's actually amazing how when you expect a lot from people, they deliver. When you expect less, they relax. So I don't think it has to do with a fees must fall. It has to do with leadership that expects a lot from its people, that expects people to do stuff for themselves and help where you can. This thing of entitlement, government must build a house for me. That's not where we should be. Where we should be is, how can you help me? This is what I have. I just need this push, right? And that's leadership. Um, I'm afraid we are out of time. We would have loved Dr. Tlamini being here with us for the rest of the day. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, we can go for it. So um, I would like to take this time to thank you all for helping me moderate this session. It's been a great pleasure. Dr. Lamini, thank you for being here.